ready for uh, your, uh, you can start your uh, your uh, interesting lecture whenever you are ready thank you very much uh, i hope the screen is visible it is very visible uh, first of all i would uh, like to thank iraqi endodontic society and professor hussein sir for uh, inviting me on this platform and uh, giving me an opportunity to share my thoughts with the Iraqi students and endodontists. And when I say I share my thoughts, I also say these are some of my experiences, which are evidence-based. And at the same time, I if, if we were, it is very unfortunate, we are not able to meet face-to-face, -face, but if we were meeting face-to-face, -face, it is always an opportunity for us also to learn from each other as learning is a give and take a process so today the topic of my presentation would be retreatment in endodontics and uh, this topic is really uh, close to my heart because i uh, firmly believe that everybody should be given a second chance and if we really feel that there are areas for improvement and there are areas where we can uh, treat the mishaps and correct the mistakes, then definitely there is a chance to achieve success even through the failures. So that is what I would be uh, discussing here, that how do we decide and how do we treat failures so that we are able to achieve success. Now, when we are talking about success here, the most important part is to understand what is a failure and what are we looking at, right? Now, in endodontics, I see failure. When I see a case in which a root canal treatment has already been done and the case is referred to me for some reason for retreating it. So the first and the foremost thing is I need to see what is the failure and what has happened, right? So a failure for me is basically an opportunity to find an appropriate intelligent logic which I can use to treat it and reach endodontic success. Now, when I am saying that to find an appropriate intelligent logic, that does not mean that I am sitting in my dream world and I am just making my own decisions or we are just making our own decisions and become a superman in endodontics. No, whatever decisions we are taking, whatever logics we are applying, those logics have to be evidence-based so that we know that we are going on the correct path, right? So if they are evidence-based, then there is a lot of scope that we will find success. If they are not evidence-based and we are just trying to do hit and trial method that we might go wrong with the case selection or the way we do the uh, treatment, right? So that is why I have put a word intelligent logic, which is basically evidence-based. So we need to be very strong with what evidence, what support do we have to support our logic or our treatment protocol. So we should not be afraid of failures. We should always think failures as an opportunity to find why that mistake has happened. What is the reason? Can we correct that mistake? And if we can correct that mistake, then definitely there is a scope for improvement and success in that particular area. Now, the aim of this presentation is basically, we all know that I'm talking on retreatment in endodontics. So definitely we are talking about failures, that why failures are happening and how do we treat those failures. But the basic aim of this presentation is not to tell you what are the different type of failures. The basic aim of this presentation is to show you those failures. And then we together, we have to analyze that how this failure has happened, what has happened, what must have gone wrong, then when we see this failure, how can I, then to imagine, develop our imagination to find a way to how minimally, uh, how we can, you know, uh, treat this failure by minimally destroying the tooth structure. And then whatever mistakes have been done initially by, by other dentists or by somebody else, then those mistakes should be an opportunity for us to learn and to achieve success. Right. So it, it, it will develop our own imagination. 
which will be again evidence based once we make that imagination then we correlate it with the uh, present evidence and then we go ahead with the treatment so to analyze failures develop our imagination and use the mistakes of others to learn and achieve success we we will watch this small presentation which i generally call as an endoflix uh, like we have netflix we have you know amazon prime and all those sort of things we have a then we should be having an endoflix also which i will take you through a journey of a slight literature review because a uh, literature review is very important in every case because whatever we do the backbone is books literature journals and other other sorts of things so this is the backbone so literature review is always very important then we will be discussing seeing some failed root canal treated cases we will be seeing their causes of failures then what were the treatment options available at that time so we will be going through these four key areas while we are watching this endoflix presentation now when i say we'll be having a literature review we know when when i talk about literature i know when the moment i will say literature many of us will go off to sleep i know that because uh, sometimes it's very boring to go through literature but i have not put a lot of literature here uh, i had discussed with professor hussain sir also and uh, we had discussed that it has to be more clinical because people want to see they don't want to read in lectures also right now uh, mean means we all are like me only not not very good in reading you know so the thing is uh, when we talk about literature review we know there are journals there are test books but there is a new literature that has developed and mostly uh, this is the power of social media and those books are the following books which i call it as facebook of clinical endodontics and is instagramology of endodontics whatever case we see so many cases which are being uploaded these days and then once they are uploaded on social media then there is a fight of likes dislikes hearts reactions so many things so right now presently we have a lot of material which is ready to be seen ready to be learned from but the only important part we need to understand is that from social media we have to be intelligent that what we have we have to pick up that what the the person who has posted this what does he want to show what is important for us and what do we have to pick up from that particular uh, social media or that particular case that has been shown regarding test books and regarding journals we do not have any doubt the more we read them the more we you know understand better and the more we are able to apply them clinically right regarding facebook and instagramology we have to be really uh, you know intelligent enough to see that we are not disadvantaged by that or we don't understand things in a wrong way and then we start applying them on our patients so definitely it's good to follow social media even if you are following anybody's case my case or i am following somebody's case i always look for the key points that what is what what is he trying to show and what am what is there for me to learn into that right now when we talk about literature we know that in literature these are the various reasons uh, with different uh, significance which are uh, present and these are the various endodontic mishaps that happen in a clinical practice while performing endodontics and they have their research has shown that they have their own significance and they are at the different level of you know importance in terms of causing a failure but what we feel is that once instrument has fractured once a canal has been missed once an under obturation has happened then it will cause a failure now there there is a there is a little little uh, tweak in this what i feel and what the literature also say is that these are definitely endodontic mishaps but these endodontic mishaps basically do not lead to failures what they do is they only make us uh, you know a uh, handicap in performing a good cleaning and disinfection of the root canal system and once we are not able to do a good cleaning and disinfection of the root canal system then we are giving 
chance to microorganisms to develop and microbial infection to develop. And that is basically a reason for failure. So again, I would emphasize here that when we do a perforation, when an instrument fracture happens or we can see a case of missed canal, definitely they are a you know, reason of failure, but they are not the direct reasons for failure. They are the reasons for us. They are the reasons to make us handicapped to do inadequate cleaning and shaping. And then inadequate cleaning and shaping is basically a direct reason to failure of root canal treatment that has been done. So in a way, if we are able to treat this mishaps again, that if we are able to take the fractured instrument out, or if we are able to treat the perforation, then we are giving a chance for the tooth to you know, survive and show us positive results over a period of time. And that is why if you see a study that has been uh, published in around uh, 2004, that has also shown, it has concluded that even when the highest standards and most careful procedures have been done in root canal, then also there have been rates of failures because it's not a root canal we are dealing with. We are dealing with, with an entire root canal system. And this system basically does not only comprise of one or two or three root canals. It comprises of lateral ramifications. It comprises of lateral canals, apical delta. So it's basically a root canal system that we are treating. We can only treat uh, root canals mechanically. But a root canal system has to be treated mechanically as well as chemically. So therefore, it is very important to do a proper shaping at the same time, give adequate time to the irrigation to do proper disinfection in order to treat the root canal system. If we do not respect the root canal system in that form, then probably we are looking towards achieving failed cases more and more. And trust me, this is, this is a... A uh, sentence that I have picked up from uh, Dr. Martin Trope, right? And I was discussing with him when this thing came up and really, I really liked it. And I took his permission to share it on my slides. I now, from my experience, I firmly believe this, that nothing is possible in the presence of microorganisms, how, howsoever good root canal you do. If you are leaving microorganisms in the root canal system, now, when I'm saying leaving microorganisms in the root canal system, I am not saying that you have to eradicate 100% of the microorganisms from the root canal system. Evidence has shown that it is not possible to uh, eradicate uh, or clean and dis disinfect the root canal system up to 100%. But what we can do is we can take it to that level where we feel that now the tooth or the peripical infection can start healing and the body can show positive results. So if we are able to do that, then even in the presence of endodontic mishaps or even in the presence of, uh, you know, challenge situations, it is possible to have success even when endodontic mishap has happened. So remember this that nothing is possible in the presence of microorganisms, but everything is possible in the absence of microorganisms. And this, I will prove it to you as we move forward with this presentation and we see uh, some clinical cases here. Now, when, when we talk about endodontics, uh, endodontics is basically uh, a branch which deal with newer materials, right? Which are more and more conservative, we have, in, in, in terms of armamentarium, we have uh, ultrasonic tips, we have magnification, and in terms of materials, we have bioactive materials which are available like MTA, bioceramics with us. So basically, there is an emerging newer devices and materials to obtain success. Now, when I say uh, we have microscope, many of the people I have discussed with, uh, you know, uh, my juniors, students, and many of the uh, uh, people who are attending lectures when they are face to face or even in webinars normal question comes that if we are not able to afford a microscope this means we cannot do endo no this does not mean that microscope is a term 
that is used for magnification. When I was a student, I could not afford a microscope. So what I did was I started with a medium range cost of loops. So we have to start with magnification. The, the moment you start with magnification, you will start seeing your own mistakes. The composite fillings that looked so good to you, you felt that you were doing an excellent job. You will start seeing on the occlusal surface, open margins on those composite restoration. And then you will realize that what, what I was doing. And when you will start correcting your own mistakes, that is when you will develop more and more interest. And that is when you will start actually improvising on your own clinical work and start as a dentist, you know, and, and perfection, or you can say uh, a good result will start becoming your habit day by day. So when I say uh, magnification, then please do not think only dental operating microscopes. I know they are very costly, but magnification means that if you are not able to do a microscope, a work under my, a microscope, then you can actually start at least from a loop. Right. Start from loops. Then however your eyes and hands start setting after one year or two years, you can just upgrade yourself as and when you require. Even when you are using newer trends or you use operating microscopes, studies and evidence has shown that in a medical field, we are actually working on a very slippery terrain because body is a magical tool which always gives us something new. Right. And I have seen this in the case while treating teeth also. Sometimes it has happened that the X-ray has not shown me anything. CBCT has not shown me anything. And suddenly when we open our throat, we see that this was not expected. So we are actually working on a slippery terrain where we can slip any time. So it's always better to be cautious. And that is why we should respect human body. And because it shows us again and again how poorly we understand it so it is really important to hold your uh, you know aggression while treating certain cases and be very patient particularly in endodontics right i always uh, joke like this that uh, that i don't need to give this advice to married men because uh, they they can they they have forgotten what is aggression after their marriage so they will be patient only the advice is to your newer generation you know this is, this is a joke I generally do that married men generally uh, uh, do not know what is aggression. So they know what is patience. So they do endodontics in a much better way than the newer generation, which is probably maybe more aggressive, right? And they just hold a bar and they just start. But, but it's just a joke. It is not that I am saying, uh, uh, telling the newer generation that you are not good. You are actually better and we learn a lot from you guys. Now, this was a study that was published. And if somebody is interested in reading articles, definitely it's a study to look up to. It, it was published in 2011, where they analyzed the causes of failures. You know, when, when we were reading at that point of time, uh, the, the causes of failures were given. And it's, it's a very famous Washington study was there, which is quoted in Engel. And uh, the, the causes of failure, the missed canal was found to be the highest cause of failure. The number one cause of root canal treatment failure was a missed canal. But surprisingly, in this study, a good part is they saw under microscope and the highest number of cases, failed cases were found with a leaky canal. This means something had to be done with the quality of obturation. You know, and the missing missing canal was at the uh, second number, second number cause of uh, root canal failures. So that is very surprising, and but it is interesting because this 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 indirectly shows us that these days less and less number of canals are missed. Maybe because magnification is used, or maybe because we all are more aware of how the endodontic cavity should excess cavity should look like and how to locate the canals but then we are not uh, particularly uh, concentrating on quality of obturation which is very much clear through this case you know this case was referred to me for retreatment the root canal was done around two years back but the patient uh, started developing some symptoms around six months back 
he tried taking medications he was uh, you know you know self medications are the number one treatment these days so he started taking painkillers but it did when it did not subside then he was referred for uh, to have a look and a root canal retreatment was suggested now the decision had to be made here was whether the root canal retreatment has to be done through the crown or crown has to be taken you know these are as a clinician there are certain decisions we have to make but those decisions have to be in the interest of the patient after discussing with the patient so when this option was given to the patient patient said that if you can save the crown it will be very helpful to me because it it involves finances while taking out and putting a new crown it involves finances definitely when you are retreating through the crown the complexity level of the case increases but then at the same time it gives you an indication that you have to be really cautious because you really do not know how the crown preparation has been done earlier or how the angulation of the occlusal surface is below this crown so the advice is whenever you are having a case of retreatment the number one choice should be removal of the crown and then doing a retreatment but in case it is not possible you have to go through the crown then the advice is then please go slow be very slow and regain the excess cavity in steps like i will be showing here now so once the decision was made to go through the crown a small excess cavity was formed with the round burr right go with the round burr and then after that the it was shifted to use of ultrasonic tips now here uh, please uh, do retreatment always retreatment should be done uh, using loops or uh, with with a very very good vision right and this uh, ultrasonic tip used to go a little more down because it is slow and it also allows you to have a proper visibility once you have you are going down i am doing a retreatment and i have to look for gutta parchas when we are doing a fresh treatment on a molar or a multi rooted tooth then what guides us towards locating canals it is the dentinal map right so but when we are doing a retreatment then what guides us towards the canal is the previous gutta percha so we have to once we enter the pulp chamber which which may be filled with gutta percha then the the first and the foremost thing is to look for a pink spot or a gutta percha which is visible from the pre operative radiograph that and you can make out that on what level you will see that gutta percha once you have seen that gutta percha then just follow that gutta percha to make the excess cavity and then you can use your periosteolar tips also to remove that gutta percha and also to give a little heat to the occlusal gutta percha you can use gp solvents to soften the gutta percha you can use a little periosteolar tip without water just to give heat to the gutta percha so that after that your retreatment files simply goes inside the root canal and engages that gutta percha to take it out ideally uh, conventionally we were using d1 d2 d3 from densply but now market is full of retreatment files and personally i like this uh, endo shaper a lot because of its spiral design and the way it engages the gutta percha and throws it out of the canal so that i get clean canals i have seen with uh, many number of files i have seen which are straight rotary files the gutta percha somehow sticks to the uh, remains sticking to the wall some amount of gutta percha and then i have to use cautiously my h files or i have to do filing of those walls to bring out that gutta percha amazingly with endo shaper files i have not seen that but yes it's personal preference and i am not saying that if you are not using endo shaper file then you cannot take the gutta percha out so i have uh, these are the canals after the removal of gutta percha they have been cleaned and intracanal medicament has been placed inside the canals for that appointment so that when the patient comes next i am ready to obturate the canals now this was the job done right and then the patient we were ready to uh, obturate the canal patient came master cone was taken and radiograph was taken master cone fit was verified cone fit radiographs 
were seen. But when I took out the radiograph, right, I suddenly saw that there is some amount of gutta percha on the wall of the canal, right. And I I felt that I used uh, I the file that I preferred, and still it left some canal. I wanted to take it out, but it came to my mind that I do not have a direct access to this gutta percha. So I felt, let me do some coronal flaring first with the use of ultrasonics and have a direct access to this gutta percha. And once this coronal flaring was done with ultrasonic tips, see, I am not using burr hair to do a uh, uh, to expand the orifice here. I am using ultrasonic tips because I can use these ultrasonic tips where the where I want them to and I'm not touching the rest of the canal. Vision is very clear. I am very specific at what point I am using it. And once I have direct access to the gutta percha there, then it is very clear to me that what I was missing, right? This is what I was missing here. The moment I did, I, I, I shifted the orifice. I expanded the orifice a little. That very moment, it was a bulk of GP lying there, which I could take out with an edge file. And the moment that GP came out, there was a canal below it. Once I found that canal below, uh, below that gutta percha, then I had to verify it on the radiograph. When, now, generally, when I am accessing such canals, I do not use my hands to hold the files. I generally use locking tweezers because we need vision to put files inside the canal. And if we are using our hands under high magnification, then our hands will block our vision, right? So it is always good to use a, a, a locking tweezer. Again, I will repeat this video where the vision is very clear and once the file goes inside the canal, we can unlock the tweezer and the file is released and the file is in the canal. Then we can put other files because the canals have already been cleaned and shaped. We can put other files and shoot a radiograph, clean and shape in a normal way. What we do and obturate. Once this extra canal was found, patient immediately became asymptomatic. By the next appointment, he was relieved of pain. And I knew that this was the uh, reason for the peripical infection, peripical radiolucency to happen and discomfort to the patient. So the necrotic debris was removed. Another classic case which was referred to me here was and uh, of a bowler, mandibular bowler. And this was the pre-operative radiograph which was sent to me through WhatsApp, right? Now, once the, I saw this radiograph, I suspected uh, some uh, extra canal immediately, you know, that and that I call that we, it is very important to read the radiograph properly. And I generally call it as mapping the radiograph. Pre-operative radiographs, I uh, you know, refer them as blueprints in, of endodontics, blueprints of the teeth. Whenever we, we have to make a new house, we first prepare a blueprint of that house, you know, so that we can imagine how that house looks like, will look like. Similarly, we take a radiograph first, pre-operative, to see that how the tooth looks like and what possible challenges it might present to us. So I generally, in as, as a preference, I call them as blueprints of the teeth. So let's do a root canal. The first part of RCT says, read the radiograph carefully, confirm your findings either clinically, radiographically, or if required, you need to take a CBCT, you take a CBCT, and then you try what you have found on your investigations like radiograph or CBCT, right? Here, what I saw was there is a break in continuity in this canal. And that sounded something fishy to me. So I tried to see first under magnification. Now, I, I would like to, uh, you know, uh, throw a question here uh, to everybody that do you really think in such cases or in every endodontic case, CBCT is required? Because I know that CBCT is a very significant and a very important diagnostic tool. 
but what we feel or what uh, is observed is that many people use cbct just to look for a fourth canal or you know for even small little things so i feel personally that sometimes the use of cbct is not used but it is abused you know so uh, my uh, my uh, question here is that after this presentation definitely i would uh, like to hear that whether in some of the cases cbct was required or not required so i i decided to see this uh, case under magnification first and i requested my colleague to send me a pre operative radiograph just to compare the original pre operative radiograph with what he had sent with the working length radiograph so once i saw the uh, excess cavity under magnification what we observed was that the distal canal the distal orifice is unusually large you know it is it is unusually large than what it is usually so once it was observed then a deeper look was taken and three orifices were located clinically under magnification once these uh, orifices were located and working length was taken and cleaned and shaped immediately the patient was felt relief of pain and the patient uh, was really you know uh, free of his symptoms and then then we generally uh, next next in the next two days it's it's a habit uh, that we try to follow up the patient and give a call to the patient and patient says i am feeling much better the pain is relieved so it is very clear now in this case since i was using magnification i never felt the use of taking a cbct unnecessarily three orifices were very clear they were cleaned and shaped following a normal endodontic protocol nothing magic magical had to be done here it was simply an observation that had to be done clearly and then they were obturated again i uh, i am not in a favor of you know taking 10 different uh, uh, angulation radiographs to show on social media that uh, three canals distal split was there and when i can see clearly three three splits under magnification clinically i do not want to over expose the patient to radi and and go under radiation hazards for the patient just to show three different canals and different angulations so take a radiograph it is according to the working length everything is fine patient is asymptomatic it has been referred back to the same dentist now the first and the foremost step when we do a, a excess cavity preparation we need to understand that how deep we have to go right we start in the center of the tooth with a round burr like i have shown in this video and we feel a drop right that is what we have read in the test books that wait for the drop to feel and once you feel a drop that is actually the depth of your cutting in a vertical direction you do not have to cut vertically more than that depth because basically a drop means that you have entered the roof of the pulp chamber you have broken the roof of the pulp chamber now only thing that you have to do is you have to just remove the roof completely for which you do not need any vertical cutting you need lateral cutting along the sides of the tooth right so if we understand this point then there is no reason that our burr will ever touch the pulpal floor it will never touch the pulpal floor and we will never have pulpal perforations right now the only thing is the role of pre operative radiograph is very important here because if the pulp chamber is nice young child or even an elderly uh, population but the pulp chamber is good then you will feel a drop but if you feel it's a calcified pulp chamber or it has pulpal stones in it you see calcifications there then we have to be really cautious that whether we will feel a drop or no and once the drop is felt you can change your burr to an endo z burr which is a non end cutting burr in case you don't want to change you can use any burr that you prefer i personally many a times prefer a prosto diamond tapered shaped burr but i know that i can control my hand and i will not go deeper inside and you have to just do a lateral cutting and not a vertical cutting this is the direction we have to cut once we feel the drop right 
and this is actually what happens and what we should be doing once you have felt the drop right then only cut in a lateral direction do not cut in a vertical direction only vertical movement has to be along the side of the wall and not down inside the pulse chamber right and once you have de-roofed the pulse chamber put your endo probe tg16 probe to locate the canal orifices once you have located the canal orifices use your file with a passive motion just to see the potency of the canal you do not have to we do not have to clean and shape at this moment right so if we so we don't have to be aggressive here but what happens once we when most of the times what happens is many of us try to locate the canal with a burr only right and once we are not able to locate the canal with the burr we try to just jiggle around here and go a little more deeper oh it must be here no no little more i should cut and i will see no this this is what is going in our mind you know that oh no 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 little more i can go okay let's go a little more we go more deeper and we go in a different direction which is separate from the direction of the canal and that is when our 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 burr leads us to a perforation because burr is a high speed instrument and it goes in any direction and causes a perforation it is a very good idea to mark your burrs if you are not confident i have done that personally i have done that the moment i have felt drop i have marked the level of the burr so that i clinically can see that i don't go deeper than that this i used to do in the beginning of my masters when i was uh, i just started with and opening a uh, excess cavity so that i do not go wrong otherwise this is what can happen right and we can have perforations like this and if we are uh, i don't know we should not be i should not call that we are lucky enough but i was lucky enough to catch a perforation like this which which was beating like a heart you know i could see the tissue below the perforation and now we will move on to a case similar case which would be probably i call it as a endodontist dream right uh, because it had all sorts of uh, endodontic mishaps which are uh, available in endodontics it had miss canals it had a ledge formation short obturations and i suspected because of this focal radiolucency i suspected a floor perforation patient had a root canal done around 2 to 1 and a half years back but patient really wanted to save this tooth so we started the endo procedure and even if you are doing a retreatment as i said in my previous cases go very slow and stay conservative you know it is it is very easy to uh, expand the cavity but once the cavity has already been overcut then we cannot grow it back you know grow the tooth back so it is always good to to start small and then expand if it is desired patient had a mesio occlusal proximal restoration here started between in the center of the tooth with a tip uh, a conventional triangular excess cavity and the moment we reached the pulpal floor redness was seen which was clearly evident that there is a pulpal floor perforation now without touching that perforation previous gutta parchas from the buccal canals were taken out and the perforation was again looked for the removal of gutta parchas were verified on the radiograph and when the gutta parchas were removed on the radiograph it was realized that pal palatal canal has not been touched at all you know even in the previous treatment even in my this present visit i had not touched the palatal canal because my concentration was on the pulpal floor perforation and the buccal canals gutta percha because i didn't want to touch the pulpal floor perforation at this point of time otherwise it will start bleeding and it will take a lot of time for me to stop bleeding and then do my job this was the perforation medicament placed perforation was scheduled to be uh, cleaned and then sealed with a proper bioactive material in this case bio uh, mta was used here 
Now the canals, buccal canals, were temporarily blocked with gutta percha sticks. We can use uh, Teflon also if uh, we are comfortable with. But I have, I was comfortable with uh, uh, gutta percha sticks because after placing MTI, I can simply pull out the gutta percha stick and my job is done here. And here I would like to emphasize that while placing uh, MTA, uh, the video has stopped. But I hope it will start. While placing MTA here, do not pressurize or do not push MTA beyond. Place it very passively. Just throw the pallet there and with very soft hands, just use hand pluggers with to condense MTA there. You can use hand pluggers, you can use backside of uh, bigger paper points like uh, uh, 50 number or 80 number, but do it very gently because I know there is no harm in extruding MTA, right? Beyond uh, the uh, tooth, but do we really need it? Do we really need to do that? I don't think so. So my rationale behind this is when I don't need, even if it is a bioactive material, why should we be uh, lazy to uh, just uh, uh, condense it softly? Right. So as I said, aggression is not required in endodontics. So just condense it softly. And once it is condensed, use micro brush. You can use a moist micro brush to do some hydration and just uh, spread MTA evenly. Once it is done, you can see here uh, a micro brush is used to condense uh, MTA and to just do a hydration. This is done. Patient is recalled in the next appointment. Now, while taking out the temporary, I was using a micro, uh, I was using endo ultrasonics. If you observe here, what happened was the mesio-occlusial restoration just popped out totally. Once this mesio-occlusial pop, uh, restoration popped out, the palatal perforation, which I had not even expected, you know, it became very, it was not bleeding, nothing happened. Uh, suddenly, I see a perforation when uh, mesio-occlusial restoration comes out. This means that in the previous treatment, when it was done, there was an attempt to search a palatal canal. But since palatal canal was not being able to uh, locate it, then uh, the it, uh, perforation happened. But it was not sealed at that point of time and just buccal canals were obturated which is very much evident on the preoperative radiograph also. So I decided to seal the perforation, but before sealing the perforation, I decided to locate the palatal canal. And again, I used an endo ultrasonics because after placing MTA, I did not want to give uh, the vibrations of endo ultrasonics on MTA and contaminate MTA with uh, debris here. So I just wanted to uh, locate the canal first, again, disinfect the uh, perforation and then seal the perforation with uh, uh, bioactive material. And you can see here while using endodontic ultrasonic tips, we have not touched the perforation at all. If we do not have endo ultrasonic tips, my advice is to some extent we can use perio ultrasonic tips also, you know. We all have peri-ultrasonic tips. If we do not have endo-ultrasonic tips, that does not mean that we cannot do such cases. And then MTA was placed. What I felt was since the MTA was covering around 80 to 90% of the pulpal floor, I just wanted to give an additional layer of protection to MTA. So I blocked the canals of with uh, gutta percha after preparing them. I blocked the canals with gutta percha sticks and just through glass ionomer cement over MTA and build the whole pulpal floor with MTA. Once this was done, the tooth was treated as a normal, uh, you know, tooth cleaning and shaping was done. And this was the master cone radiograph that was taken. Decision of, uh, there was a broken instrument in mesiobuccal canal, but decision was taken not to take it out because if the attempt to take out this uh, instrument, which is broken at the apical part, was done, then more harm to the tooth can is possible. You know, we will have to remove the uh, 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 surrounding dentine, which 
probably since it is going very thin and the apical part, I might do more destruction to the tooth rather than helping the tooth. I tried to bypass the instrument, but I was not able to bypass the instrument, unfortunately. So decision was taken to leave the instrument there and obturate whatever we have, right? Obturation was done. You Bioceramic sealer was used and obturation was done. When we are doing retreatment, the most important part in retreatment after you do the treatment is recall. And once the patient was recalled, then this was the uh, radiograph which was taken. And you can see here that whatever mishaps we had, body showed excellent healing despite of having a pulpal floor perforation, despite of having a ledge, despite of having under obturations and instrument fracture. So this case clearly shows that it is not the endodontic mishap that causes the failure. It is the inability to do adequate cleaning and chipping because of endodontic mishap that causes the failure. So if we are able to remove or he, uh, correct the endodontic mishap by any ways, then we are on the right path and body has to help us to heal. So the importance of recognizing a correct excess cavity is very uh, significant here. We should know that how much we have to expand our excess cavity. For that, we should be following laws of excess cavity. You know, one of the laws of excess cavity says that when you see the excess cavity occlusally from all sides, the enamel, dentine and pulpal floor junction of your axial wall should be in one line, which is very much clear in this excess cavity that if you see it, if you are seeing it occlusally, the whole uh, axial wall in all four sides is in direct line with your uh, pulpal floor junction. And you can see a very beautiful isthmus here. You, we, we have to use isthmus as a dentinal map, which will guide us towards extra canals if they are present. You know, and we, we should be locating extra canals because the evidence shows that maxillary molars, lower incisors, they are associated with extra canals. So if we are uh, treating a maxillary first molar, we should always keep it in mind to look for extra canals so that we do not land up in missing a canal and causing a failure. Once you have located all the canals, now is the time when you take a step forward towards your cleaning and shaping protocol because now you have the number of canals which are present in the pulp chamber, right? Because the canals, how, so, how much ever they are present, five, six, seven, three, four, whatever are the number of canals, they are present in that particular pulp chamber only, right? Once you have located the canals, now is the time where you have to just do a little bit of orifice widening. Now, if we are performing rotary endodontics, we have orifice shapers from different manufacturing companies, right? But if we are not doing rotary endodontics, then in those cases, we can gently use GG drills, right? Uh, you can use a number two or number three, depending upon what type of case you are handling. And you, you, we do not have to go deeper. You can see in this video that it is showing that only in the superficial half, coronal half, we are trying to just, you know, in and out movement of GG drill we are doing so that your orifice is widened. Because if we do not do the widening of the orifice here, then it is difficult for us to negotiate the whole length of the canal. If we are doing rotary endodontics, then in that case, we are having orifice shapers from different companies. Sorry for the sound here. Right, we are having shapers from orifice shapers from different companies, but we do not have to push the orifice shaper up to the full working length, right? Just let it go to the point of resistance. Do not push your files at all. Be very passive with your files. You know, you have to do a passive movement and not an active movement. Once you have flared your canal, it will definitely help you to uh, remove any stress from the instrument. Your irrigation syringe will go easily inside the canal. And then also a lot of space will be there coronally for irrigant and debris 
to come out and if you are doing a multi visit root canal treatment then clinically it will also help you to uh, have a look and find the canal very easily in the subsequent visits if we do not have a straight line access and we do not do a canal shape uh, orifice shaping then we can have mishaps like these which are called as instrument fracture now if you see this tooth instrument was fractured open referred for a uh, re treatment here now here uh, take we follow the normal steps the first preference in an instrument fracture case is bypassing the instrument right but in this case the the instrument is too long and bypassing is probably not a very good solution here because a lot of length has to be bypassed so there are a lot of chances that we might go wrong at uh, while bypassing and might have a perforation with hand instruments so working length is taken in rest of the canals and instrument is viewed under magnification first is we have to view and now this is where i was saying in my uh, uh, first few slides that we have to imagine and develop you know now one i once i see this picture then my iman imagination runs that i have to do i do not have to touch the buccal half or the mesial half of the orifice here i just have to touch the part of the orifice which is towards the lingual canal you know so i will only touch that part and i will just expand that part to expose the instrument and you can see that i have not touched the other part of the canal only the inner wall of the canal i have touched and i have expanded it and i have cut it throughout till the instrument so that i am able to expose the 2 to 3 mm of the neck of the instrument and loosen the instrument and then use a right armamentarium which is a btr pen in this case right armamentarium to hold the neck and take it out so a conservative approach was taken here because uh, i could imagine that what has to be done i just needed an armamentarium to uh, execute that you know once this was done obturation was done and you can see in the obturation that not much of the dentine has been sacrificed here so it was done uh, in this way and then the case was referred back to the colleague for uh, post coverage full endodontic restoration once the canal has been located and orifice shaping has been done then pre curving the file is of utmost importance when you are uh, uh, negotiating curved canals because i believe that majority of the canals have slight amount of curvature so it's always a good idea to pre curve the file but always remember that do not uh, work in a dry canal your canal should always be moist it should be having such small amount of irrigant inside it so place your irrigant inside the canal then pre curve the instrument and then you uh, negotiate the curved part of the canal because irrigant will to some extent will uh, act as a lubricant also you know and then when you pre curve do not rotate the instrument here you can see the movements of the file here hand movements it is just quarter turns being given and you will be able to negotiate the canal to the full working length easily in presence of a, a, a irrigant so you have to always work in a wet canal never work in a dry canal pre curving only does not only help you to negotiate the curved part of the canals but it also helps you to locate any lateral canals or any bifurcations which are available as you can see because uh, when you pre curve the instrument then the pre curved part of the instrument can run in 360 uh, direction rather than a straight canal which will run which will rotate only in a 180 degree you can see here once it is pre curved it can easily go in the bifurcation area or it can easily go where the canal is dividing into two or in the lateral canal so it and you, thus you can clean and shape your canals properly with a pre curved instrument if we do not pre curve the instruments then there is always a risk of you know ledge formation here if we are putting a straight canal here 
then the file uh, straight uh, file inside a curved canal here then the file will only go keep rotating at one point and we will feel we are cutting dentine to negotiate the canal but actually we are making way for the uh, ledge to happen and if we continue cutting there then perforation can happen very easily and the instrument go in a wrong direction rather than going in the direction of the canal here right which is very much evident from a case like this which was referred with this radiograph again because the dentist realized at the master cone radiograph that there was a perforation that had happened and he had missed on the uh, main canal and now when the uh, file was being placed again and again it was going in the perforation area which is but obvious because the perforation area has become really big as i told in the very beginning it is my habit to request my colleagues to send me a pre operative radiograph so that i can have a blueprint of uh, you know the uh, the tooth i'm working on and we can see a good uh, curved canal here so i am very much uh, you know careful now and i know that i am what i am facing here is a perforation second is a curved canal right open the tooth again and look at the perforation first first view of the perforation now the job here is not definitely the conclusion here is to seal the perforation but in various steps so the first step is to dry this perforation and clean it for a better visual but in a passive way so i am using a paper point here i am not using a suction pressure intracanal suction tips i am not using because it will create more pressure and it will cause more bleeding you know once i have done this i have cleaned the uh, area properly shaped the canal and you can see here i will be pre curving my instruments here i will be pre curving my instrument also here to put so that my instrument does not go in the perforation area it goes inside the canal once it cleans and shapes that area you will see automatically the perforation is on one side and the canal is on the other side you know so and this i could only do because of magnification otherwise it will be a hit and trial method so magnification is a very significant and important part of endodontics and here you can see a main canal and the perforation after cleaning and disinfection protocols the perf granulation tissue has subsided over and the inflammation has gone down and now i can actually obturate the canal and fill the coronal part of the uh, canal with the M with mta now when i am pre curving my instruments then obviously i have to pre curve my gutta perchas also so that it follows the same direction of my instrument if i am not doing that then again i am risking that gutta percha might go again in the perforation area but all of this has to be done with a proper vision if vision is not there then it becomes difficult for me to negotiate this part once it has obturated the coronal half will be obturated with mta and you can see that mta's perforation has been sealed the curved part of the canal has been negotiated and obturation has been completed using endodontic ultrasonic tips even perio tips as i said that to some extent we can use perio tip i really love using them when i don't have endo ultrasonic tips i use perio tips because at least they will give me a vision you know they, they will allow me to see what i am doing and i can be very specific to an area where i am touching even in cases like this where i have to remove this bulk of pulpal excess pulpal chamber gutta percha i can use my uh, you know uh, tips ultrasonic tips to remove gutta percha from these areas and cut the remaining dentine you can see here dentine was there gutta percha was there so it becomes very easy for me to do that because this ultrasonic will produce heat gutta percha will melt and will become softened and it will come out faster than my usual conventional methods of using a probe and also i can use ultrasonic tips to remove post metallic post from the canal like in this case they will just unscrew it 
Use it in anti-clockwise direction so that canal is visible. Excess cavity, when you make bulk of pulp you have, like in this case, right? I Be patient. As I said, we have to be patient. Just tease around the uh, boundary of the peripheral boundary of the excess cavity and just try to expand the uh, excess cavity till your uh, uh, till the time you get axial wall and pulpal floor uh, chamber in one line. Once this is done, then all the pulp stones will come out. All the you know bulk of the pulp will come out. Now see this pulp is nicely lying inside. It is attached to the canals. But since I am slowly and slowly expand, this is the kind of excess cavity I will get. You know, so ultrasonics really help us to stay conservative and go in a correct path. If I will probably if we use burrs here, we will be aggressive because they are fast cutting. And at some point of time, we might lose control here. So it is always good to be slow and soft handed. Now, another type of mishap that we actually see is very commonly see is post uh, perforations while uh, doing a post preparation. Ideally, the post should follow in the direction of the gutta percha. When you are cutting the uh, gutta perchas or when you are preparing a post space and removing gutta perchas with post drills, then we need to be very strong with our tactile sensation because when we are removing gutta percha, the post and the handpiece will feel very soft and it will be very easy for the post drill to go inside. If we feel resistance while cutting with a post drill, immediately we should understand that we are cutting dentine because it is only dentine that will be hard to this much of rotation of the post drill. Because if the drill is rotating on gutta percha, it is at the same time producing heat and it will be very easy for the gutta percha to soften and come out. So your hand will feel really soft. If you are not following a straight line axis and not following a direction of gutta percha, then it is very easy for the post drill to go in a wrong direction. And then that is the, that is the cases when post perforations happen. And not only during removal of gutta percha, there are certain cases where gutta percha is not even touched and the center of the tooth is totally, you know, perforated. Like in this case, where uh, perforation was right in the center of the tooth, this was a premolar. And when it came to me, it looked like a vertical fracture. Straight away, it looked like a vertical fracture. But patient did not want to extract the tooth and patient wanted to just give it a try. And I, I, I very frankly, we discussed with the patient and we told the patient that extraction will have to be done at any point of time <coughs> because uh, we are not able to do CBCT because patient could not afford it, right? So CBCT was out of question. I really wanted it to be done in this case. So we told the patient, you have a calcified canal. These are the endodontic mishaps we are looking at. So if we are not able to treat it and there is a possibility of vertical fracture, if your abscess doesn't go down, the side doesn't stop, then probably it has to be taken out. Retreatment was started. Excess cavity was made. Gutta parchas were removed. And suddenly some metallic part was seen inside the excess cavity. The moment that metallic part came, I went inside again to have a look at the pre-operative radiograph, but could not see any metal there. But when we removed it, it was a metallic post, which was right in the furcation area of a premolar. This means actually the only thing that was connecting the uh, canals was the side walls. Otherwise, right in the center, it was uh, perforated. I did not use MTA here because I wanted a material which will seal the perforation, but at the same time, allow me to clean and shave with rotary instruments because MTA and with this bioactive materials are powder liquid combinations. And when we use rotary endodontics, this can re easily erode, the file movement can easily erode this powder liquid combination and then micro cracks will happen and leakage will start happening. So I use GIC and you can see in this picture that the inner walls are also sealed with GIC. Then it was cleaned and shaped in a usual way. Calcifications were opened with C plus files and it was obturated.
as i said recall is one of the most important factors of uh, root canal retreatment and you can see healing happening after 1.2 years and probably i would like to see this patient again post perforation can happen at any point of time root canal was done in this case and was sent back to the uh, uh, referring dentist for post endodontic full coverage restoration which are comprised of post preparation post placement and a uh, crown but while doing a post placement patient, uh, the colleague said that he is seeing some blood called the patient back to me placed a post and took a radiograph just to see the angulation and it was very clear that what we are looking at is a kind of perforation once we went in the distal canal it was again dried up and perforation was very clear here right the perf here the perforation i did not want any a strong uh, means i did not want any rotary endodontics to be done here so we decided to put a bioactive material and as i said previously do it with a passive movement do not do it with force i do not want uh, material to go in periradicular area even if it goes it's no harm but we don't need it there you know so do it passively softly condense it put one or two one or two pallets use uh, you can use mta guns or we have mta placing guns from different companies and but uh, here i used from pd the uh, map system and placed pallet and you can see here also softly i am placing the pellet here not doing anything just throwing the pellet on the uh, site where i need it to be placed and then i am gently condensing the pellet with a plugger here and once i have condensed it with a plugger you can see here the perforation is being sealed with mta after the perforation is sealed automatically the post direction becomes corrected and we have he we have healing after two months in this patient so endodontic mishap is not causing the failure what is cause uh, endodontic mishap uh, is not the reason of the failure non correction of the endodontic mishap is the reason of the failure so success in clinical endodontics is basically not a matter of only one decision you know it is multifactorial and it depends upon lot of things like what is the operator's justification to save this tooth whether we can save it it is not that we want to be superheroes here you know it it's not that oh i will try to save this tooth and put it on social media no not like that it has to be very evidence based that if i am trying to do it what 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 is my backbone what what strong evidence do i have can it be done so a lot depends upon our case selection right then depends upon our skill whether we are skilled to do that i have no shame in saying that i am not skilled to do a perio surgery i am not to do a advanced prosthodontic procedure so whenever patients come to me for even a bridge i do not do that just refer them to a prosthodontist we should be very strong in this character of referring the patients because it is in the best interest of the patient then use of magnification it is a must in today's dental practice if we want to improve but again as i said magnification doesn't mean that you have to invest a lot of money but start from somewhere patient motiv motivation that if it's a complex case then how motivated is the patient to get it solved if the patient is not motivated and you are doing a very complex case probably sometimes it's better to extract the case because patient will not be able to come many times for that treatment so probably it's better to extract the tooth and go for some other alternative what is the difficulty level of the case and according to this difficulty level we basically plan our treatment as in such case where i thought that i am going wrong here patient a uh, very very good, nice incident patient had patient uh, told me that i had a trauma in this tooth few years back the trauma was very interesting he had an accident with a camel right so i was really amazed that how did you, uh, you uh, uh, you know manage to hit inside a camel so he said no 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 we were chatting and just we had an accident so this was the case and patient have was having a slight peripheral redolescence but discomfort in that tooth and some amount of discoloration open the tooth as we see in the pre operative radiograph here it's a big pulp chamber then suddenly it stops you know so open the tooth saw a big pulp chunk of pulp here 
and then removed that bulb and immediately i saw a very soft spot there with a probe you know i was really happy in the same visit that okay i have the canal with me so found the canal and took a pre operative radiograph told the patient i while discussing showed the patient the radiograph that see we have the canal we will just clean it in the next visit and finish it off but somehow i felt that this this the, the location of this canal this orifice is very eccentric you know it was not in the center though pre operative radiograph showed me that it is going in the right direction but somehow i packed the patient and patient went home the patient said i am still having that tenderness i am not very comfortable while discussing with the patient somehow i referred him for a cbct when he went for a cbct i saw that what was happening actually i was going in a wrong direction you know and i am really thankful that i advised him for a cbct here because if i had not advised him for a cbct then probably i was looking for a labial perforation i was heading towards a labial perforation and now you can see here that it is very clear from cbct that i had to do a little bit of cutting and work uh, on the palatal aspect of the tooth move my excess cavity towards the palatal and locate a canal palatally to the uh, orifice that i had actually seen you know and then the canal was located again radiograph was taken and it was obturated and patient was fine another interesting case it came with this child and this is one of my last cases here and this is a case where a lot of challenges i could see as i said we should be analyzing a pre operative radiograph very closely let's see what challenges we have we have peri peri epically uh, extruded gutta percha indefinite shape of the apex you know apex is too big inadequate apical seal very obvious resorption going on thin root canals apically and in the middle part of the canal poor quality obturation metallic post below the crown and pfm so if i try to do this non surgically you know then i have to remove the crown remove the post then remove gutta percha but there is a possibility that peripically extruded gutta percha might break you know and then i do not know the exact shape of the canal so uh, this case is very very challenging to be done with a non surgical way and also since i wanted to see how big is the peripical infection and how is the shape anatomy of the apical foramen which is so wide here so i referred him for a cbct here and once cbct was done the images clearly showed the extent of the lesion the shape of the apical foramen was very much visible so we knew what we are facing and what we will be treating we exactly could plan the treatment after seeing these images here knew how much to open we so that we do not go very uh, conservative also here and the extent of the lesion was visible so after seeing this images we were ready to open and we were ready to treat this case surgically so attempt was not made to do it non surgically boundaries were marked as i always say i used to mark my excess cavities and till date i mark my boundaries when i am doing a surgical case lesion was seen bone was cleaned and the uh, canal was cleaned and as as i said you can see a 120 number uh, file here and as i told you that uh, the the canal was very wide the so the uh, the probably the file was swelling around and playing mta was placed and apical closure was done so this was the shape on cbct mta was placed and immediate post op radiograph was taken here thermoplasticized gutta percha was used to the back uh, to do the back filling of the technique but while doing this a uh, technique care was taken even if it was done after 2 3 uh, you know 3 4 days uh, care was taken that we do not use excessive condensation pressure because the the canal is very wide here and there we can risk uh, of uh, we can we can cause a fracture in the wall if we are using excessive condensation pressure so if, uh, the passive force was used to condense gutta percha here and this was the post stop after doing the 
radiograph and you can see the recall here so healing was there so decision has to be made whether we have to you know do the case surgically or non surgically what i would just advise here is never work in a dry canal always pre curve your instruments whether you are working in a pre curved uh, whether you are working in a curved canal or whether you are working in a straight canal only uh, think of uh, uh, difference is how much you will need to pre curve it all depends upon case to case but if you do not pre curve then there is a risk that you will might not be able to uh, negotiate the curvature and might go in a wrong direction and cause a perforation so again i would emphasize in the end that the reason many re as as it has been shown in this study that the reason many teeth do not respond to root canal treatment is because of the procedural errors that control the you know cleaning and shaping that do not allow us to do proper cleaning and shaping so once these procedural errors are corrected then we are back on the track and we can again do cleaning and shaping so now the time is gone where once the case has failed then we have to look for implants now once the case has failed we have to analyze whether this can be saved whether evidence will help us to save this tooth whether we have a support of evidence whether our protocol is right so if we are sure of these factors then we can definitely go forward now this case a very interesting case was uh, just published in a uh, 2021 joe right and they saw that what is the effect of foraminal uh, enlargement you know why i like this case was because many or majority of the time we are not able to control our working length and we go beyond so these these people these guys the team studied on pain perception with foraminal and the conclusion was very interesting you know they concluded that immediately after foraminal enlargement there the pain was there to the patient but if you see over a longer period of time the overall incidence was pain was considered to be slow irrespective of the working length used and they concluded that the extrusion there was no association with post operative pain and extrusion of filling material because clinically when gutta percha extrudes and we have an we have a over obturation or sealer goes beyond we always tell the patient that you might have pain or we also expect in sight that patient might have pain for some days because the sealer a sealer is extruded or you know the, the gutta percha is extruded but how these guys they they have a they had a different conclusion so which is really very interesting to you know read and probably i would definitely have to have some details on this take home messages case is important but patience is the key as i always say be patient with your cases attention to every detail must be given and the uh, attention starts from the pre operative radiograph so every uh, detail needs your attention read the radiograph properly and discuss if you do not have your colleagues to discuss discuss it with yourself you know that plan your treatment and while you are planning your treatment you automatically start discussing with yourself question yourself that is the master key if you do not have any colleague to discuss with question yourself and trust that endodontic mishap is not the end even if a file breaks from me then it is not the end of the teeth what takes courage is to admit that happened and if you can treat it please treat it but if you cannot treat it then you can refer it to a specialist who can help you out at the end of the day it will result in saving the teeth for the patient and keep yourself ready for the day when you are planning your treatment you know that this patient is coming you should be ready for the day when you are already ready and you know what case you are getting then the confidence level with which you are working is totally uh, different it you are on a you know you are on a higher note and in the end i would just like to say here is that it is our journey you know you know nobody will travel for us it it is our journey nobody can travel it is just our choice the way we want to travel it whether we want to complain for everything or we want to just have gratitude for what the uh, the force above has given us it is our decision the the uh, view from the top always looks good 
but then we need to appreciate the efforts that is taken to reach at that level everybody has to go through these journeys there are no shortcuts to reach the top it is gradually step wise you know increasing and stepping the ladder up to reach at the top i am always available on all the social media so if you have any questions regarding this presentation or regarding you know um, any other case in future you are more than welcome to uh, discuss and uh, trouble me any time it will be always a pleasure to serve all of you and in the end again i would like to thank professor hussain sir and iraq endodontic society for giving me this opportunity and i really hope that this presentation was a bit helpful to everyone and some at least one tip uh, could be taken from this presentation thank you so much i hope i have not taken long and not bored you guys a lot not at all not at all thank you very much uh, of course i really thank you for this very clinical uh, lecture uh, in, the, in the beginning of the lecture uh, you stated that uh, we agreed that the lecture should be uh, clinical because of our dentists they want to know the tips and tricks from you and really you have done it very nicely and i really uh, uh, thank you for it but uh, for such a uh, an, an, uh, an excellent uh, lecture there are uh, many questions uh, uh, so uh, uh, if we may uh, ask you of course uh, at the beginning i saw this uh, uh, two uh, buccal canal uh, maxillary premolar, which was really re quite remarkable because uh, uh, I've seen three canal uh, premolars, uh, I've treated them, but uh, such a, a two canal uh, uh, buccally and that are so close, it's quite uh, interesting. Um, I see that you uh, rely uh, on. Uh, the, uh, the the x-ray to verify the working length and you didn't specify anything about epic locators uh, do you uh, uh, use epic locators to verify uh, working lengths especially when uh, uh, the the uh, epic clinic uh, radiographically is not very uh, confirmed definitely Apex locator is the first thing that I use you to uh, uh, take the working length. Pre op, uh, the, the radiograph I generally use and I also recommend to be used as a support to Apex locator. You know, it is, it is uh, not that uh, you have to rely totally on radiograph. In fact, I had a video on uh, use of apex locator in a patient but since this uh, presentation had a lot of videos it was really becoming very lengthy and was not and I, I also did not feel that it is suitable for the topic because we were talking on retreatments there so but yes apex locator should be the first thing to be used to find uh, the to, to locate the working length and to decide the working length. but however it can be used because what happens is on a pre, on, on a radiograph after using an apex locator, again, if radiographic length looks to be short, then there is a possibility of you going wrong or the uh, technique of apex locator being wrong that we applied. So my, my advice, my take on this is use apex locator, verify on radiograph. If everything goes well, proceed. If you still feel that radiographically it is showing short, again, re-verify with apex locator and uh, see that your technique is good. Ultimately, I feel apex locator's decision is the final decision. Okay. When removing gut aperture, which uh, system do you like? Uh, you know, the uh, retreatment kits, or uh, nowadays the uh, the the, uh, the the same rotary instruments, like uh, for example, Wave One Gold or or Reciproc. Sir, it a lot depends upon the type of uh, tooth I am actually doing, right? And if if uh, I generally prefer uh, uh, pre treatment files from, but it can be from different manufacturers because now Coltine has come out with a very good retreatment file. 
earlier most commonly i was using was from densefly and then i started using indo shaper files because i really like the way it was taking out the files you know but it all depends upon uh, what uh, retreatment file i don't have a very particular preference in terms of file systems uh, when when you use uh, the coronal flaring for example with the ggs you know, and gates and uh, size two or three don't you think that the coronal flaring is uh, uh, weakening the tooth uh, or the root uh, so we, we might uh, be uh, uh, happy with removing a separated instrument but really why we might be weakening this root and uh, decreasing its uh, life expectancy very right sir uh, and and all not only weakening the uh, tooth but at the same time we are also increasing the chances of micro cracks in the coronal area in that uh, particular where we are using gg drills or if where we are forcing our endo orifice or you know orifice openers but uh, what uh, uh, balance has to be created between uh, how much force you are using and how much dentine you are removing in those areas you know if if uh, probably we need to decide on tooth to tooth based case based that how much taper we want in those areas and how much tooth coronal flaring has to be done that is why when i was showing the video uh, of uh, using a gg drill uh, you must have noticed that the gg drill was not going uh, deeper in the coronal area at all it was only on the and i mentioned also while speaking that keep it on the superficial part because that is the bulkiest part of the root canal you know that is the bulkiest part so even if i take two drops from that bulkiest part then i will not create that much of a problem if what i will do if i go deeper with my gg drill and while using a gg drill we have to be really cautious also because if we go a little more deeper then there are chances of you know perforation also increases thank you very much i uh, am very uh, i'm happy and uh, thankful for uh, uh, for you, you sharing your uh, uh, knowledge with uh, with us uh, uh, really retreatment uh, uh, is getting to be very important because many are using or doing in the dentics and there are as you uh, increase in, you in, uh, you uh, doing indo there there are bound to be mistakes and uh, uh, cases that you know, need to be retreated so really it's a, a topic that's uh, very very important these days uh, at the end of this wonderful lecture i really thank you very much i uh, uh, hope to see you in future events and as a token of uh, appreciation and respect Uh, to you, the uh, society and the Iraqi Dental Association, the uh, uh, scientific committee. Uh, uh, our, uh, we are going to present you a certificate of uh, participation, which is going to be sent to you uh, directly and will be posted on the uh, the uh, uh, page of the association. Really, we thank you very much and hope to see you in future events. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I'm so glad to uh, be a part of it, and definitely I would look forward to some future collaborations uh, for lectures or for research, whenever uh, you feel it is a uh, good time. Thank you so much for this opportunity once again. Thank you and uh, good night. Thank good night, sir. Thank you so much. شكرا جزيلا لكل الحضور ان شاء الله نلتقيكم الاسبوع القادم مع محاضر يعني لمحاضره اخرى شكرا جزيلا